Uh, we had to cut back our budget. We had to really rethink things. And during this email exchange between Jim and I, uh, that was copied on several others, Jim's passion was that, that the chapter should be member driven. And it shouldn't be driven by the board. And I just want to relay that to you. That as members, uh, you know, let your board know what you're thinking. You know, get that input and get involved. Because at the end of the day, if the members don't care and they're not involved, then the board's left to do the work without that input. So I just encourage you to do that. Um, so and then uh, we have a great lecture series this year and uh, a lot of events. And Rob Miller, is, uh, as president-elect, uh, it's been his charge to, to put that together. And it's exciting because the, the college and, and the chapter have unified to, to pull their resources together to bring an exciting group of lectures. And uh, I think you're going to enjoy it. I know a lot of the students good to see you here. Uh, I think you have time with Steve today and a uh, pretty dynamic guy. Uh, so at this time, what I'd like to do is just turn over to Rob. He's going to just tell you a little bit about the year to come. So welcome, Rob. Thanks, Steve. As Steve had said, uh, CAPLA and uh, AIA Southern Arizona have joined forces for a number of these. I'm only going to tell you about the ones that are uh, specifically designated as AIA events. We have a number of other uh, CAPLA events, and they're will be on the AIA website so you can see them. Um, on March 27th, starting at 4 o'clock, you can do a tour of Old Main, which has been completely uh, um, repurposed as the administration headquarters. It's just amazing that we have a, pre a president of the university who recognized the symbolic importance of moving the president's office back into the historic part of the university. And the planning, design, and construction team have done an amazing job, as have um, Corky Poster and his team of uh, doing the renovation of the building. So if you come at 4 o'clock, you can see a tour of that under construction. And then at 5.30 at AME, we're going to have Bob Smith and Keith Durleen from Planning, Design, and Construction talk about the procurement process of architectural commissions at the U of A, what they see online, and answer your questions about how to do well, what's coming up. I think that'll be a great program for practitioners from all around the state. On May the 7th, we will have a barbecue with ASLA and APA at the uh, garden uh, between the new and old buildings at Kapla in celebration of the completion of the capstone presentation. The capstone gets presented in three days. We always have lots of architects who come to, to see and serve as uh, critics for that. So we're going to have a barbecue to celebrate their completion and, and bring our colleagues together from planning and landscape architecture. On May 15th, the executive director of National AI, Robert Ivey, will be here and will be giving uh, a talk in this room. Over the summer, we have a uh, design competition coming that will be announced soon. The, the really interesting thing about this design competition is that to enter, you must have a student and an architect. Those are the base requirements to team up. And it will be a competition designed around the arid climate desert landscape. Uh, in either late September or October, Kenneth Frampton will be coming. We're still looking for that uh, specific date. Uh, in October, we also have the state conference. And for you students who are here, uh, the School of Architecture will be taking a bus, and we'll be taking as many AIAS members as would like to go to the state conference. Uh, there's someone here that I'm going to introduce in a second who made that suggestion, we followed up on it. So we'll have big student turnout for that event in the fall. 
And then in November, on the 6th, Todd Williams and Billy Chen will be here. Both of them will be here to give a talk for us. And for those of you who may not remember, they won National AIA Firm of the Year last year. So it's a big year for us. Now i I hope to see you for all those things. Arizona has a, a wonderful community of architects. Uh, while we may not recognize it in-house, I think there's no question that out-of-house we see there's an Arizona school. It's a strong, committed, um, like-minded group of architects who design with respect to the landscape and the place and the climate and the environment. And we do some great work here. And among this community, we even have a few who are internationally known figures. And I'm happy that one of those figures is here to introduce our speaker. Help me welcome Will Bruder. It's great to be back in Tucson. It's even a more special evening for me to be able to introduce a friend to you. A man who comes from a country that is not unlike our state. It's a unique place. It's surreal at one level, it's sublime at another. And Studio Granda, which is made up of Marguerite and Steve Prester, have created a body of work in the last 30 years which is profound. Living on the edge, they have done both works of urban significance, as well as buildings that grow naturally, emerging from the landscape of a very, very interesting place. It's a place that's inspired by the horizon, as is Arizona. I've had the privilege of visiting them and a good deal of their work, and working with them as far as an academic situation, but just the work is beyond everything. You're going to see some beautiful images tonight. These images are about 10% as good as the work really is. It's work that when you get to it, at every level, it's conceptually strong and challenging. It's work that's nuanced about the place, it celebrates making and materials, people and curiosity. There's also a sort of glint of a spark of, of a playfulness in the eye of this architect, and it comes through in the work. I encourage you all to make the journey to this place on the edge. This work stands high among his colleagues from Scandinavia. Both Marguerite and Steve have a great body that we all can learn a lot from. And I feel very privileged, and I know we're all going to learn a lot from this presentation. Steve. Well, thank you, Will. I actually don't quite know how I can follow that. It's uh, that's quite a challenge. Um, can I give you the mic? Can I just press the button? <laughs> but really, our relationship started eight years ago when Will Louise came to, to Iceland and, and knocked on our office door. And, and I think he was actually, well, they really touched by the place, but what he hasn't told you is the most memorable thing about Iceland is it has the most expensive hamburgers in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so, Will, it's a great pleasure to be now in your desert. Thank you very much for setting us up. Rob, thank you for taking the baton and your people in school and setting it up and arranging everything, arranging the flights, arranging the show, arranging the so-called masterclass today, which lasted an hour and a half. <laughs> and it's just gone beautiful. I don't think I've ever done such a well-organized show as this one. Chris, thank you for today for taking the job. George Hall Play School, that was a real trip today. That was memorable. It's a real pleasure to be in Tucson. I'm going to try and tell you about a place that Will is trying to express something about. It's very difficult to explain what Iceland is. It actually doesn't make any sense. Everything that you look at in Iceland is upside down. It's a place that really shouldn't exist, but in reality, it really, really does exist. And for me, it's been my home for the last 25 years. I'm actually an Englishman. I'm the fake Icelander in the room. I I apologize for that. But I'm going to try and give you a little indication of what this place is about, why we're there, and the sort of things that we do there. 
you'll get nice pictures if you can turn these lights off. Is that a possible deal? Does anybody know how these buttons work? <laughs> This is a test. These ones here, because they, they like the screen. And then you don't see me, which makes things sort of go much better. <laughs> okay, while they're sewing that up, it's great to give, give tasks to people. Um, this way or that, the whole thing about being in practice for these years is that at the end of the day, we've got absolutely no idea what we're doing next. And we actually have no idea why we're doing any of it. But it's a lot of fun. So we will, each time we do something, we have to decide if we go this way or that way. And usually we decide to go that way, but then change our minds and go the other way halfway through. So here's the first one. To put you in the picture, this is where you are, and this is where we are. You see, they're almost the same, but yours has got lots of brown bits and a few white bits. You've got a lot of white bits and a few brown bits. Um, but we've got six and a half million people. We have 315,000. Remember that number. It's a very, very small number, but actually rather a big landmass. And don't forget that you're part of a much bigger nation, the United States of America. Iceland is a complete nation on its own. It doesn't have anything else. It's out there all on its own in the middle of the North country. Just to give some indication, you're 1,400 square miles, and we're 39,000 square miles. So <coughs> you're three times our size, but you've got 20, 20 times the number of people. There's not many people that live here. And most of them live here in Reading. This is where we live. To be honest, it's actually the only place that you can exist. Everywhere else is like <laughs> back and beyond. But there are a few people that live out there evacuating. That's a city in Icelandic terms. The village that I was brought up close to Oxford was of 20,000 people. So there's a, a sort of mindset you have to set yourself into when you go to Iceland. And Eostar is this major metropolis in the east of the country of 2,300 people. It's also the second most airport for all uh, transatlantic flights. Iceland actually serves all transatlantic flights going from Europe to the US. It's the biggest international uh, air traffic control uh, region in the world. Um, the emergency airport for these routes is here, but if that one's closed, then the planes have to land here. So it is actually a significant place. Now, the other thing that makes this place special, and it makes it very different from you guys, is that we're at 66 degrees north. Now, 66 degrees north isn't just a line on the map. It's the point that in the depths of winter, on the 24th of uh, December, there is no summer. And at the same time, at the same point in the summer, the 23rd of June, there's continual summer. We have this condition of darkness and lightness. And this is an extraordinary condition, and actually that is the main building element that we have in this country. We have a few rocks, in which you can make concrete, you can make driftwood, but the major building component that we have in the country is light and shelter. And that's got a lot to do with being here. The other thing we have is lousy weather. 100, 150 mile an hour winds are no big deal. No dustbins going into neighbors' gardens, that's just what happens every other week. You know, people complain about tornadoes and stuff. Uh, we have, have tornadoes for breakfast. So that's just way <laughs> over And then if it's not bad weather, we also have all hangers blowing up today. We have uh, 300 active volcanoes in Iceland, and I had an email just before I came to this lecture. My daughter was taking a picture of geothermal water that was blowing up through the pavement outside of our house. So there's never a dull moment in Iceland, and that has an effect on the way that people live, the way that they uh, are as, as a populace, and altogether they're rather nice. But there's one thing that's very dangerous about Iceland, and that's the fauna. And the the most vicious ones in East here. It's the female species. Thankfully, there's only 150,000 of them, but they're so tenacious and so cunning that they trap dumb animals like this one <laughs> and drag them back to their bear and keep them there. Well, no. 
half their lives. It's, it's really cruel. <laughs> but this particular one, even though she's nasty in many ways, has actually been my, my partner for over, the, over, for over 30 years. Uh, in those 30 years, we've lived and worked together almost 24 hours a day. It's actually quite an extraordinary relationship, and we're still friends, we still work together, we've got three kids. I'm really sorry that she couldn't be here with me tonight. So Margaret says hi, and I say, hi Margaret, next slide. <laughs> and I said we don't have many buildings. Not surprising, we only have 300,000 people. So as the, uh, the German chronicler said in the, uh, in the 11th century, the mountains are the castles. And this is still the way the Icelanders look at buildings. They don't see buildings as, as the things that are the major objects. They don't look at the uh, cities, the people call them cities, as the major cities. They look at the mountains. Every morning they wake up, they don't look at skyscrapers, they look at the mountains. It's a very deep, rooted part of their psyche. Now, <clears throat> this is how Iceland was in 1789. Not an awful lot. By comparison, just to put you in the picture, this is what you have here. So you realize that our history is really short. You talk about your short history in America, Iceland has got a really short history. And it's doing it all on its own. So even going to 1900, that's all we have. That was record. This is the capital. This is the nation. This is New York, this is Washington, this is LA, this is Portland, Oregon, this is the lot, this is everything we have. This is our building history. And most things you see have actually important. This is uh, the Parliament building, and still is the Parliament building. It's actually built by a <coughs> Danish architect, a Danish craftsman. And most of those you see are imported kits from Norway, the Norwegian timber. Only later, but they then hire the corrugated line that was imported generally from Britain as ballast after they take the ship and sell it to, to the brick. In 1915, this is the major industry of fishing and they dry fish on, on the beach. This is just down low from where I live. So this is this is when the Industrial Revolution was well gone underway in most parts of the world. And Iceland is still in enormous subsistence distance under the crown of Denmark. 1929, we started to see the influences of modernism. And Icelanders took modernism, but they couldn't do it the way that everyone else did. And in the other parts of the world, did white, we did it black, you know. And I'm going to follow the rules. Then the city gets big in 1950. This is following independence from Denmark after the war. And here we see the pond in the center of the lake, which we'll talk about later. And this is <coughs> Kringbury. You see, this is, this is actually the Kringbury, is the ring road that was to she closed the central, or actually to, to enclose the wrecking, that was to be rendered with everyone within the ring room. Later in the 60s, there was a new enthusiasm, a <coughs> new um, optimism came into Iceland. They reached out to America, we had the road engineers, we had new blocks coming in, and we had geothermal water that's piped directly to house in the city from boreholes, which actually were originally in the city, uh, within the city. Um, Earlier, but actually is now piped in from 30 kilometers away. This is when Iceland had its boom years. And this continued. 1987, we really would embrace modernism. But even in 1987, they didn't have a city hall. They had actually managed to get to the point that the city had actually established itself. And they felt bad about that, but we actually felt very good about it because we won the competition for the city hall. <laughs> So from our basement flat in London, we did this drawing. And a very brave mayor chose it. And when we went for the job, for the interview to say, you know, this is a job and so on, and we expected to be linked up with local <coughs> practice, we were absolutely flabbergasted. We said, Margaret Steve, congratulations on winning to the competition for the City Hall. Uh, we're not sure what kind of deal we want, but we thought we might just like uh, a time break. So we said, okay, all right, if you really insist, we'll take up a time rate for this job. And four and a half years later, we built the city hall. It was an easy project. We had an anti city hall terrorist organization that planted bombs. It had uh, they 
um, put dead minks on the, the mayor's windscreen, slash his tires, and send death threats. And we had an anti city hall political organization that wrote uh, campaigns over every day for at least two and a half years. But the remarkable thing is that when the building opened, 50,000 people walked through the building in three days. Yeah. 50,000 people is half the population of Reykjavik, or one sixth, or actually at that time, one fifth of the population of the whole country walked through that building. And the building was taken into society, you might say. It was adopted by society. And the fact that it destroyed all the floors of the building and had to be finished, and it was a small price to pay for that, etc. <laughs> now, the building actually is on the borderline between the city and the lake, as I pointed out to you earlier. And we tried to make that relationship very clear. So it's always got one foot in the lake. It's always half in the water. It's always <coughs> somewhere between where it's comfortable and somewhere where it's uncomfortable. And this is, this is the city lake. And this is the city hall. It's a city council building here. And this is the office building. And because we put some of the building into the lake, we took the lake and took it away here and put it into a new artificial lake in the corner. So we gave a lake back to the city. We also want to make sure that this was an open democratic building. This wasn't to be a city hall that they had big steps up to the, the front door. This was a building that was open for everybody. So you could enter here, we could enter here, we could walk over a new bridge that we made, we could come up in the car <coughs> down below. You can even go through on rollerblades if you wanted. And from that space, you can look down at this public hall here, which is actually a covered square because the weather's so bad. Sometimes it's not good to have events outside. You want a place inside. And this is a place that is open to everybody. And it's used for showing what the city's doing. Planning <coughs> things, it's at conferences, dance events, art shows, you name it, they go on there. Now, if you move further away from the building, we also want to make clear that the building wasn't just stopping on the outside walls. We continued with this bridge here, but then when the bridge got to the other side, it then continued with these walls here. So even though the walls have the impression that we were built before the city hall, there is something about their design which captures something that is in the building itself. So it extends into its context. It's actually making its relationship much, much more tenuous and insidious than would normally be the case. And this is the wonderful thing about working nicely, because you are able to make things from scratch. We have to invent a new way of building. When I showed you the earlier slides about how Reykjavik has been developing, you'll see there's actually a very little precedent. So everything that we do, we have to make up from our own viewpoint. As an architect working in England, I knew how I had to behave. It was a rule book. Every single thing I did was following a pattern that had been pre-described by architects before me. Not once, but many thousands of times. If I stepped over a line, I always knew I was stepping over the line, and I became edgy or something else. In Iceland, you are always stepping over the line, because there really isn't a line to begin with. And this is a tremendous freedom and a tremendous honor to actually be taking part the creation of an architectural language for a nation. And it's something we don't take lightly, and it's a, a responsibility. And you'll see that as we go through the book. So this is where you can enter under the building on the other side and into the central walkway, which takes you through here and out to the big on the other side. To the right, you have the view of the hall. If we go through that wall, we go to the, the pond, which we've given back to the city. Above that pond, the city council chamber, which we'll come to short, uh, shortly. But more importantly, in this area, we give another thing back to, to the city. Because when you build a building, you actually destroy nature. We thought that nature needed to have some space for itself. So we took some lava and we made these precast lava blocks. And then we add a little bit of water and rather a lot of time, and we got a moss wall. And so the building has been occupied not only by people, but by nature. It actually has its own time scale. It doesn't operate like us. In, in springtime, it's bright, it's verdant, it's gloomy. But in wintertime, it becomes a sheet of ice. So the building changes its coat according to the seasons that it's served. 
Now above this is the City Council Chamber, which I told you about before. And here, the back wall isn't the wall of the building, it's the city itself. And if there are large issues at stake, the members of the City Council cannot be not aware that the populace is expressing an opinion that maybe isn't the same as theirs. In this case, it's the opinion that it isn't perhaps the best idea to take a huge loan and build the biggest dam in Europe to, to serve the needs of an aluminium smelting plant uh, owned by the company Alco. But those people who made that decision, and they made the dam, and they flooded 35 <coughs> square kilometers of virgin tundra. And we built this plant for a country that now has junk bond status. And also, it can produce aluminium cheaper than anywhere else in the world because they get the electricity at the cheapest rate uh, in the world. They can also exhaust more toxins than anywhere else in the world because Iceland's got the lowest low carbon rating. And more than anything else, because they <coughs> offshore all their profits to a sister company in uh, Ireland, the electricity company, which actually produced more electricity this year or the last year than any year before, actually makes a loss on this deal. So maybe once in a while, the people in that room should look at what the people outside the room are saying. And that was the function of the building. Unfortunately, the building failed this time. Sometimes you don't get our sums wrong. But this uh, construction was also something that helped us force a crash. And the crash that you had, we also had in Iceland. I'll talk about that shortly. But many of the issues or the fallout from the crash will be discussed in this building here. This is the Supreme Court building. Uh, when you're a young arrogant architect, the most important thing to do is win every competition that comes along. And after the, the city hall, we won a house in Germany. And the third competition <coughs> was here from the Supreme Court, and of course we won that too. So it means we're invisible. So this is the Supreme Court. It's placed between the former National Library, the Ministry Building, and the National Theatre. And the city hall was highly debated because it cost an awful lot of money. And we realized when we took part in this competition, the only way to win it is to make sure that it was economically sound. So we didn't just do the drawings of the buildings, we also did a cost estimate for the building and itemized every single part of it. But we knew in order to make the cost estimate stand up, we had to design the building in detail. So we designed far, far too much in the, in the competition stage, but because we don't anything else to do, we spent our time to do it. And the, the way that we made the building cheap is we made it small. We made big rooms like this with big ceilings, we made small rooms like this with smaller ceilings. This is a big courtroom, this is a little courtroom. So you can see the big room here and the room here. And that meant we could have four stories here and three stories here. And that gave us the excuse to join them with a ramp, because every architect wants to have a ramp in their building. <laughs> I mean, you've all been students, you know the story, but we got it. We got our ramp, which is great. And because we could make the building this sort of assembly of rooms that were precisely the right size, we could make it smaller, not only in square meters, but in cubic meters, and therefore prove that it was cheap, and therefore win the competition. And so, a couple of years later, it looked like this. And that was Johnny Hoover, very happy about that. And the remarkable thing is, is that this is where your subconscious comes into design. Because here we have a pallet of material. Now the building behind is made of shell sand render. The building over here is, is a, a flint render. And the building which you can't see on the slide is finished with white. We didn't want any of those buildings. We're trying to find something that would be authentic, something that was going to be earthy, the grit, but also look towards the future. Now, for some reason, we thought, okay, we want to use the, the, the native stone, which is basalt. And then we thought, well, if you make basalt really special, you can heat it up, you can make, make, make a metamorphic rock out of it, and nature does that very nicely, it's called gargoyle. So we use that here in the entrance area. And then we thought, well, we want something else, something that's something that lies with a bit modern, or something I mean, a bit technical. We were thinking about stainless steel, and core 10, and zinc. 
And of course, we're thinking about copper. And they think about brown copper, but <coughs> no, something you wanted patinated. But Jim Sterling had just done a Belsundum factory in Germany. And we thought, oh, no, we can't do that because it's going to be a fashion material. But the building there said, no, I want to be green copper. And I said, okay, Tony, so, okay, if you want to be green copper, we'll just have to shut our ears to Jim Sterling. We'll just let you be green copper. And this is the palette and material that we got. And the thing is, we didn't realize until after the building was built why this palette came about. It's because, and I think I took the slide out, no, it's because in summertime, this meeting, in this mountain, the bottom of the street, has got exactly those colors in it. It's got the green of the copper, it's got the color of the rock. The building is exactly the same as the mountain. We didn't know it, we didn't design it. It was our subconscious talking. And this was a really wonderful thing that we discovered, just allowing buildings to happen. Don't force them. Too much design, you kill it. Too much love, you kill it. Just let it happen, let it come to you, let it flow to you. And that's how this building is about. Now, Laura is a very strange thing. And when you walk through those doors, you have to go to another world. So you make a split through the building. This isn't the real world. On the other side is the world of the court. It's the world of law. It's an abstract place. It's a place where decisions are made that are outside our normal reality. And this is something that permeates every level of the building. So when you go into it, you go into this space, the reception room, and then you take this long walk up the ramp. As you're going up the ramp, the walls go in on you, they force in on you. They give you this sense of compression. And we'd like to think that perhaps <coughs> that's what it might be like to be in turn. You know, if someone's put in a prison cell for a day, they'll probably get bored and they will watch a few videos. If they get put in a prison cell for a week, and they get you seriously bored. If they're in there for a month, they kind of go a bit crazy, and if they've been there for a few years, I actually don't want to meet them. So we have to ask ourselves the question, when you make a judicial judgment, when you put someone away in prison for a time, are you making the world a better place? And that is the function of this building. That is the function of the history. And this is something we took very seriously in the building. We also think of the floor. This was actually the cheapest way of making the floor. It's a regular concrete that we finished with a terrazzo finish. It's the same material here, which is just boardwalk concrete sandblasting. Same material, two different finishes, two very, very different qualities. And then you can ask yourself the question, what's better, this one or this one, or is this the purity, the, the purity of gypsum, the right thing? Is that where we should be? What, what is the right thing in life? Where is, where is law in this? You could say that this is very honest material, it's showing us what it is. The gypsum is actually smashed up bits of rock mixed with some kind of glue and paint on the surface and then acrylic paint on it. So sometimes you look at the white and think that's pure, but in fact the concrete, the crudity is much more pure. When you walk up, turn around on the top of the stairs, there's something to touch. The building engages with people before you go to the courtrooms or before you look out the window for your last opportunity to look over reality. When you're in the courtrooms, they surround you. Looking towards the corners here, there are no corners, because the law has no corners. It is endless, it is moving, it's always shaped by precedent, by things that have gone before, but it's, it's a slippery beast. Law is something that we're never going to get a grasp on, and that's something we have to understand when these people are judging the case that is put before them. If we go to the other side of the room, we see the audience is a room with square corners. They are living in the world of reality, we know where we are. We're living in a very, very different world from the world of law. Just a small aside, when we're doing this building, we're also doing highway bridges. And you'll see there is a relationship between the aesthetic of the high court and the highway bridge. And this is something we find really engaging. Working in the small societies we do, we can't specialize. There is only one city hall in, in Mecca. If we made ourselves city hall architects, we'd be unemployed for the rest of our professional careers. So we've got to take every kind of job that comes along. So we do highway bridges, we do planning, we do furniture, we do bathrooms, dining room tables, you name it, we do it. And I really love the bridges. Because they don't have any windows, they don't have any plumbing, they don't leak, it's just a pure sculptural object. And by working in that sculptural form, you actually learn new languages of sculpture that you can apply to buildings like Supreme Court. I think that's 
a great privilege to be able to work in those two, two um, and if you go up to the smaller courtroom, or up with the small ceiling, you can see it, here's a, a very different scale. And here we're getting natural light only borrowed from the side. So we realize we want to put a little more light over the top here. We put a roof light over it. And the joke is, of course, that lawyers have to say the truth. Because if they don't say the truth, it comes a bolt of lightning down from above and finishes them off. And actually, they've even told us the story that it's been the case that the lawyer's been there and he's, they're not sure about what he's saying is right, and there's come a hailstorm, they can't hear a word he's saying. So, <laughs> even the joke was true. But the, the thing that was really beautiful is that the lawyers came to us and said, we'd like to give you a piece of art in this building. Now, they thought we would go to an art gallery and choose a picture with a frame which we could present when the building was open. But they didn't reckon on us, and we suggested that they commission the work of art. <coughs> but remarkably so, they were very, very positive, and they commissioned Spiral Bjornstock to produce this piece here. Now, the wonderful thing about this piece is that it's made <coughs> precisely the same uh, materials as the building itself, which is gypsum and then white paint. But here you can see this is architecture, and all of a sudden the architecture turns into art, and turns into architecture again. And this was just one of the many moments that we've had in engagement with artists that we realize something magical has happened. There's something that is actually beyond what we could have done as architects. And it's actually been part of an ongoing relationship that we've had with the art community, which I think has been very much uh, an, enjoy, a, a, an enjoyable part of our work. Uh, if you just go to the top floor, you see the same. This is this is the outside part of the, the, uh, the roof light goes up through here, and that creates a core to the, the judge's quarters. They actually make the judge the judgments up here. The, what happens in the courtroom is a confirmation of the conclusions that are made up in this room. And here we just wanted to get some place that they felt comfortable in. So this is almost like a mother figure in the center of the space, but also anywhere they go, they can engage with the room. There's a sense of tactility to it. They can touch it and feel good. There are places you can stop, there are places that you can pause. There's, you're not pushed away from the building, it engages you. Uh, the final building, a lot of the major public work that we've done in, in Reykjavik is the Reykjavik Art Museum. Now, every now and then, and it doesn't happen so often, we have the opportunity to refurbish an existing building. This was a, a warehouse that was built actually during the war and then after, you know, prior to the war and then uh, finished during the war. And it's on the harbour front. And the city bought part of it. They bought two floors here and two floors here. And in the middle, it's a courtroom, uh, a, 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 a courtyard. And this created a problem in the competition because to get to this side, to this side, you have to join it in some way. And we weren't quite sure how you should do that because you like the courtyards, and if you go from here to here without making some sort of thing, you're going to get extremely wet, and it's all very cold living where we do. So we tried long and hard to find how to do it, and looked at the, the split between what was built before the war and during the war, and connecting at the edges and so on. But in the end, we dragged out an old map and found that at the turn of the century, the main pier in Reykjavik was exactly here. And this was this the shoreline. But all of this, this here is built on fill. This is the harbour here in the north. And we said, this is fantastic. At the time that the pier was there, all culture didn't come by aeroplane. It was before the time of the aeroplane. All culture came in through this, this pier. So we'll call this a new pier. We'll make a cut through the building. And we'll mark it by the entrance with a piece of concrete and cut out and split up. And this cup is where all the culture comes back into Reiki. It comes from the art gallery. So we adopt that, that function and make that the core of the new building. Then from this central space, we can move up staircases to the galleries, which are actually just finished as they were. So some of them were more concrete, so we left them as more concrete. Some were half painted, half concrete, so we left the concrete where it was and repainted. 
and others who just painted white put lights in them. Sounds easy, but you know, when you're redoing 99% of the building, it's a little bit more complicated. But I don't need to bore you with the details. The thing about making that leak, of course, is that it ruined the beautiful courtyard. And we were upset about that because we don't like giving anything away, especially something as beautiful as well. So what we did, the courtyard was here, but we made doors into the new room so that even though most of the time it was shut, if you want to open it, there's nothing you can just open to the court, and then you can enjoy the courtroom, uh, the courtyard as it was. Or from the inside, you can look out like that. And this is something that has proved really, really popular, especially with um, fashion shows and the, uh, the music festival Airways, which some of you may have heard of. This takes a place here, it's actually a packed venue. So these are three buildings that we've done in Central Town. And it's been our contribution to creating the place in Reckon. It's the City Hall here, the Supreme Court here, and the Reckon <coughs> Art Museum here. Now, we then got involved in a rather complicated piece of work. The Central Reckon is here. This is called Corsa. This is a historic part of Reckon. You remember that from my first slide. This is where Reckon started. This is where the nation started. And one of the most important corners was this one here. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about this, and everyone wants to buy it and rip the place down, but they also want to develop this area here. And this is a new development area, and also this bit here, that were more than triple the size of the historic centre. Now, we started getting a bit impassioned about the historic centre. And if you look at the three buildings that made up that corner, you see this one made in 1852. This was uh, a priest's house. It was uh, a travel agent for people that wanted to emigrate to the US. It was um, a photographer's. It had a history that was long, complex, but nothing like as complex as this building in the middle, which was built in 1801, which was uh, a police station, a law court, a synagogue, uh, a strip joint, a drug dealing den, a record store, a fashion shop, and basically you name it. It's, uh, and it's also the smallest uh, uh, royal palace in the world for 100 days. And this is the first cinema in Iceland, which is the third building on the bottom, which is built in 1918. This building is burnt down in the mid 80s. These two in the centre. Metamorphosized in many ways, but were always the center of Reykjavik until 2007, they burned down too. Now, we were called onto the, onto the, the, the scene and we were in the shop of marriage with two other architects who were conservation architects, architects that were experienced in doing up historic buildings. Now, doing up historic buildings is not our thing, you know? We make modern buildings, I think, educated. I've been educated to make modern buildings. We don't like old fashioned buildings, that's what we used to do. We don't want any part of that. Rebuilding modern buildings is pastiche. Okay, you give me a lecture. Right. But this is such a historic thing. This is such an important part of our national identity that when we took part in the competition to rebuild this, we made suggestions for buildings around. But for this corner, we said that these buildings should be reinstated. And this was a really important decision for us to make. We'll talk about that in a moment. But before I get there, we won this competition. And then there was the crash. <coughs> and Iceland went from a place which was the most expensive place on the planet, and Iceland's were proud of that, to a place that had more Range Rovers, Range Rovers imported than the whole of Scandinavia put together. It was the place. <coughs> where we had some of the largest banks in the country. And one of the guys in that street was on the verge of buying American Airlines. That place went belly up. It was so bad that the, mayor, the, the, uh, the prime minister, and I've forgotten to connect up uh, the vice he said, God bless Iceland. Nobody says God bless Iceland. But this meant that the shit had hit the fan. It really meant that Iceland had gone belly up. And when you had Lebanon brothers, you thought things were
fired in the States. But I still had three banks. All of them were bigger bankruptcies than them of us. And one of them is the world's biggest bankrupt ever. Now you might remember a number 315,000. This was the scale of the crash that we had. We as architects lost everything. And our practice is not alone in losing 95%, and I think that's a conservative estimate. 95% of our work evaporated in a week. We're exiting the basket. We're doing every kind of project commercial, from headquarters to infrastructure to planning, every market was served. Because we knew that things were going to get rough, but we never imagined it would go this far. But we survived. We went from nine people to two. Other people evaporated, other people managed to survive. And the populace stood up and objected to the government and said, you screwed up. And they stood there with pots and pans, every Icelander and their dog, and complained and said, down with the government, and the government got changed. And the most remarkable thing is, when the new government came in, is that they decided to continue the building of the um, concert and conference centre that was on that promontory of land out by the harbour. And that building is Harpa, and that was finished last year. The building is by Henning Lassen Architects, who was designed by Oliver Ellison, the artist, and it was awarded the East Van der Rohe Award last year for reasons that we don't quite understand, but jolly good for them. <laughs> and of course that sounds like bad vibes, and of course it's bad vibes because we all want to do the project, but I certainly would not have wanted to be part in making the biggest concert uh, all in, in Scandinavia. I think that was a silly thing to do. But still, Ellison was very proud of it. So, there we go. But the other thing that happened, which now I can bang my own drums if I'm good at that, they chose to go ahead with our project, we were very thankful. So we took part in rebuilding the centre of Reykjavik. There's a spoiler of the new Reykjavik, which is going out by the harbour. Uh, collaborative architects, did this building here, one did this one, the other did this one, and we did the new cinema at the back. And this was a real lesson. Now, for you that have been building modern buildings, it's actually really, really hard to do the old stuff. <coughs> it's something that you, you thought, you know, all those guys say, just do it, and of course I can do it if I really want to do it, but I don't do it because I'm a new marketer. But if you get stuck into it, it's actually got many, many more tricks than you really realize. And trying to do those wobbly things that the old guys did, you know, that did, like falling off a log, it's really tough. And trying to do all this curvy stuff in concrete, that's really difficult. This was six weeks worth of form work with a car body guy, you know, with body filler and glass fiber and stuff, working under a tarpaulin. And then they cast it in one piece. It's a magnificent piece of work. And the incredible thing about this building is that the populace loves it. Then we did this building, and every single person came up to us and says, Thank you so much for doing this beautiful building. We're so happy to have this building. That's slight different to the other projects we did. Because in this one we didn't hear anything from our architect friends. All the other buildings said, the architects came to did a great job, did a really good thing there. But the populace didn't say anything. And you have to ask yourself the question, who are you working for? Are you working for your fellow architects? Are you working for society as a whole? It's a wake up call. It's really tough. And this is a lesson that we've, we've had to go through. And I don't know. I'm not quite sure where my position is in it, but at least I've discovered that there's this thing called symmetry and I'm now allowed to use it. <laughs> and I would encourage you to do, try it. It actually is quite enlightening. It's a tool I've never done before. Now, We've been downtown, we've, we've been rebuilding downtown, but this is this is <coughs> the, the ring road that's supposed to, to contain downtown. But Icelanders, they don't have much to do those dark nights and they've, they've been reproducing. So the town got bigger. So what happened is many years ago they got a Danish office in because Icelanders always think you have to get experts from abroad. And they decided the new centre of town should be here, which perhaps isn't such a bad idea if you look at how the geography of the town worked out. And there was supposed to be the new library, the, the, the city theatre, and shopping mall, and business district, all that. 
And part of it got built. So we got the, the city, city here's it, and we got a, a shopping mall, and we got lots of car parking. And because it's Iceland, somebody builds a shopping mall, so somebody else gets the idea, hey, shopping mall, mall is a big thing, so we'll build another one right next to it. Uh, that's how everything is now. Like right now, everyone's building a hotel. I think we have about 400 hotels being built now while I'm talking to you. I mean, Iceland is going crazy. In the same way that they had mink breeding places, and they had fish farms, and they had video rentals. Everyone does the same thing, and everything goes bust. So, of course, there are two shopping malls, and they can't survive. So this one goes bust, this one like this one, and then wants to connect it and extend into it. And the client, this one is a good client of ours, brings us up and says, look, not can you do this here, but can you do the car park for the extension? And he rings it just for Christmas and says, well, car park, that sounds like a great idea, because car park's like bridges, remember? No windows, no plumbing, nothing to go wrong, no leaking. <laughs> so we get this car park job here. And we've got to take the surface parking that was, uh, if I remember how many cars, we have to triple it. We have to triple it on, on the same block, but we also have to put it in public space. We've got to pacify the neighbours here complaining about attrition from, from the car parking and noise and so on. And it has to be cheaper than the ugly car park here on the other side of the building. And that's a tall order. So the way that we do it is we put all the cars as close together as possible. If you make it small, it's a bit like the, uh, like the Supreme Court. Make it small and it's going to be cheaper. And then we put a hole in the middle, we put on two floors, put a hole in the middle so it lets air out of the ground floor so that it ventilates naturally. But then it gets complicated because there's an art piece, there's always an art piece. And the art piece has been won a competition by this artist here. And he's wanting to put his art piece, you know, by the, by the car park. But because the goalposts have changed, because there's new owners, he can't put his art piece. So we're stuck with this guy. And we said, we don't want a bloody art piece. You know, it's Saturday, it wasn't good. Bill, it's five years old, he's not interested anyway. We don't want the art piece, we want the artist. We want him. We want him to be part of our team. So he joins the architects and engineers and consultants as an artist. He's paid regular rates like we are. He joins us on the team. Now, of course, he's an artist. He, he starts doing stuff, you know, he makes these things and places around, like I say to Will, he puts another turd in the plaza. And I say, Christian, we don't want, you know, a piece of dog dirt, we want, we want a car park. And you can be part of, you own this car park with us. It's your job as much as ours. You're actually doing the biggest art piece in Iceland. So actually, gradually comes around and working together, we make this car park. We realise that the thing about car parks is that nobody loves them. It's like the drains you guys were doing today, you know the loves drains, and the same way nobody loves car parks. When they get built, no one's going to deal with it. So we knew, and the shopping mall, everyone's got the new stuff. They got the new fashions, you know, the new outfits and all that. But it's always up to date. Shopping, uh, the, the car park is built, and it's there, it's forgotten. So instead of working with the, the Tiesboro today, we're working with the Tiesboro for the mountain. We want something fundamental, something that ages gracefully and always going to look great. So we use some rusty metal. Oh, okay, old tricks. And we, we put some lights there that are going to look sort of a little bit graphic in, in summertime, and in wintertime they look pretty, so everyone goes and does the Christmas shopping. And then, like I said before, we have to get between the floors for the hole. In fact, the hole in the middle of the staircase that we make out of something, something called prime evil. This is made in a shipyard. And that gives you access to this hole where the rain comes in. And all the rain on the top deck comes out through these gargoyles and feeds this growth with uh, uh, carbon dioxide infested muck. And it means that the plants grow extremely well and actually fills the air uh, with no air conditioning or what you call ventilation stuff. So the whole thing is all very natural. And we also make, make vistas, places where people can walk. So you can get out of your car, so you want a place that's nice next to this garden. So it's not a nasty place. Think about car parks, they shouldn't be nasty. They should be as nice as anywhere else. And then we get to the edge of it, we have a square, and the square is framed by, by sheet metal and piling that we use as a structural wall to the upper deck of the car park. But it's also, this is a foil to the basalt we use for the planning of this stair core. Now, 
what we do is we make this one vertical because far side gives you vertical, vertical input, and far side horizontal because it's normally vertical because it's the chopping bar, the chopping bar is fake. Did you get that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we thought that was really funny, but okay. <laughs> that was, that was, you know, okay. But the other thing is that here comes the artist, who, aside from working with us all the time, he still wants to play his turn with the father, and the turn of the father is this box here, which is called GameStop, and GameStop means store. Because he thinks that if we store all the things that were sold in the mall at the time that we made it, it's going to be a big reminder of the kind of junk that we spent our money on. And actually, at the time, it didn't seem to be such a bright idea. But if you saw the sort of things that people were spending their money on, you realize that actually this is quite a reminder. And in this store, we've got sealed in uh, hermetically uh, closed packages uh, nasal hair clippers, and we've got skateboard outfits, and we've got all kinds of ugly shoes, and rallies, and other kinds of stuff that you would never imagine that people would want to spend their month's wage on, but they do. And that's just predictive of sort of people like Icelanders, and maybe other people are. So, in the end, after starting in a slightly antagonistic relationship, the two of us ended as really good friends. And we now work together, and as Christian would say, we are now joined together as architect and architect. So we have this. The sheet metal piling was a sign for our collaboration. And that continued in another project. And this is a very special project for us and a very sensitive one. A good client of ours, actually, part of the client body that owned the shopping mall, had a tragic family, uh, a tragedy happened in the family, they lost their daughter. And they went to Christie and asked if he could design a memorial to the daughter who was buried in this, this churchyard here. This is a hard project for Christie. He worked on it for, for about six months and actually found it so hard that he, in the end, said, actually, I would really appreciate the studio brand if you could join me on this project. And we thought it was pretty sensitive too, but we agreed and more or less took it to Christine. And working together, we were thinking about how can we make a memory for this young girl who was killed in a, a traffic accident? How can we make how can we make it serene and right? How can we do it without being hacky or over the top? And of course, Everyone is thinking about a piece of granite or some other expensive stone that's about six by six foot with some text on it. That's, that's the fact that standard, and there are different variations of that that you can imagine. We worked on that for a while, and we looked at the church and that was interesting, but it didn't really touch us. So we started looking beyond, and we realized that there was something special about this place that we couldn't find without a finger on it. We saw some marks in, in the aerial pictures. So we went, <coughs> looked around the place, and we saw <coughs> the fields that surrounded this place. <coughs> Sorry, I have to go back. Excuse me. You see, this is the Reykjavik conurbation here. It's right next to it. It's very important to remember. But in these fields, surrounding the churchyard, <coughs> there were remains. And the more we looked at the remains, the more we realized that we were looking at something really, really significant. And it thought to us that here was something that was very precious. This was something that was beyond us. This was actually <coughs> the remains of a medieval Viking village. It had been recorded by uh, archaeologists. They recognized it, but for some reason it had gone under the radar. And we thought that this was a place that was under threat. This was a place that needed to be identified. This was a place that needed to be preserved. So going from a piece of six by six granite, we decided that perhaps the best memorial we could give to the client was to say that he creates this, or he makes these 97 hectares of land a historical conservation area. And uh, this was quite a hard concept for us to, to uh, accept for ourselves. 
until we saw what the plan of the local authority was. And this was happening just prior to the crash. So everyone was thinking big. Everyone was looking to sell every lock. When we saw this drawing, we said, I think, we think, we're doing something absolutely right. So we went to the client, and actually it took him a few seconds to say, of course, that's what we're going to do. We're going to do this in memory of my daughter. That has been done. The area is now a historical conservation area. This was a really real achievement. But we also realized that in a way we haven't done our job. We were on. She left us. She was born in 1987. We felt that there was something that needed to be brought attention to. We could look to the past. We wanted to look to the future too. We felt that this was a retrospective. So we, we thought a bit further, and we realized that if we looked at the, the church, it was built in 1879. You see the other date? 1987, 1879. Just around the corner, within half a mile, there was a Danish astrologer, astronomer, excuse me, that built an observatory in 1798. Now, I don't believe in mumbo jumbo, but there's something telling us something here. So, when we went to the periphery of the site, off the edge that we had preserved, we look at here today and say, okay, we have to do something. What's happening here? What can we do? And we realized, like a much of Iceland, nothing is happening. I'm going to do a bit of stuff here. <laughs> see the pole star, unless the tide came in, but and that's all part of it, because as you know you can do something as always important as doing it. But if you get wellies on and go out there and wait a while, you'd see something like this. And we thought that it was really, really wonderful, we were very happy with this project, and we thought we managed to touch on something very, very special. And a client thought so too, but he wanted to spend his money on something else. And lucky for us, that something else was this house. Because they were living in uh, Denmark at the time, and they had a house in Iceland, which was here. Yeah. And he had not allowed to enter this house because they'd lost it with them, and that house had technical problems. So they wanted to take it down and build a new one. Now this would normally be a relatively simple house, Apart from the fact that one of the most beautiful houses in the whole of Scandinavia is in the same street. This is by an Icelandic architect called Pope the and Dottir. And we think it's actually one of the most significant buildings in Scandinavia. And as I'm sure you know from the your architecture history, that's an area that's pretty pregnant with remarkable works. But this, this house is way from the park. I mean, this is 
you're a liar, this is your option, this is, you know, this is the top of the line. And what she did, she took the Icelandic turf house and she jammed concrete on the top of it. So she did it vertically. And we thought, well, we can't do it vertically, we're going to have to do another, we're going to have to match this house, or at least we're going to have to pay it back. So we looked at the turf house and see how it developed over time. It started something, well, you become a little bit more evolved and then eventually turn to something modern. And we do a house, something similar. <coughs> so we take our plot, which is slightly trapezoidal in shape, and now we're at this end, at this end, and we put a full light roof on it. So because if you take the roof, the roof is being flat, you crump it up one end, you get crenellations here. Oh, excuse me, that's the wrong button. Excuse me. Yeah, we get the crenellations here, then you get a flat bit here. So this is something akin to the gables of a turf house, and this is something akin to a modern house. And that turns into something like this. So through the street, you get this, this massivity, you get the grass roof coming over you. As you go around the house, you get something more. So as it moves towards the flat, here we have one of our volcanoes. But when you get around to the front, you get this in the middle of a modern line. But then if you then penetrate the house, going into it, coming through here, it then also becomes a turf house again, because here we have large spaces, which we will learn. But as you go further into the house, as a turf house is a selection of smaller rooms which is spread off a certain corridor, this house gets more and more intimate as you go into it, as you see from the, from the patio, going deeper into the library, the corridor, bedroom wing, the, the link into the gallery, and then down into the basement. So the house gets more and more intense <coughs> to go into it. And this was something that we really wanted to capture in the space. So I hope Padma in a beautiful house won't be too upset to have this in the street with. Now, back to Christie. This is a project that we've actually been we're waiting for the conclusion of the competition. <coughs> it should come out any day now, and I was hoping that I'd have to hear it before I would speak to you. Right now we've got loads of tourists, and they don't know what to do when they come to Iceland because there's nothing there. <laughs> but one of the things that everyone wants to do is to cross that 66 degrees north line. And you can't actually do it on the mainland. You have to fly to this island called Grimsa, and you land here. And you get a certificate to say you crossed the line, and people get very happy, they spend lots of money, and the Icelandic tourist board likes that. <laughs> and so they're having a competition to, to make something of it, to make a, make a tourist event. And our proposal looks actually at the, the, the line 66 degrees north, which everyone thinks is this fixed line, because in the old atlases it's a fixed line, but it doesn't, it isn't fixed, it's actually moved. This is the island, it's the other way around, because the other picture was taken from the north. And this is the cycle. Of, of, the, of the Arctic Circle <coughs> goes in and out. So here, we actually only entered the island in 1717. It was only permanent in the island from 1750. Right now, it's here, 2014, it's here. And it will go back further into the island for the next few years until it turns around in 2025. And it goes up down, and then as she exits the island forever, or for the next 20,000 years, it will go out in 2046, if I'm not We thought, well, that's great. Why don't we take a piece of island, about uh, three meters in diameter, and we'll just put it on the grass. And then all those tourists can come along, and they can push it. So they can push it where it's supposed to be. It's always in the wrong place. <laughs> they can push it here, and they push it to one of the island, and of course they push it back again. It goes there, until in 2047, they push it into the sea. <laughs> now, it doesn't come back again for 20,000 years, but we're not worried, because it'd be somebody else's problem to get it back. <laughs> At that time, I'd really be a candidate as a duck anyway. So, <laughs> That's our proposal, and I'm pretty sure we won't win the award. So, so aside from that nonsense, I'm going to tell you about another house. 
<laughs> this is the final one. I know you're all going to sleep, but I know you've got all that rotten fruit ready for drumming. Um, there's, there's a site in the Northern Ireland that belongs to a pretty lady that's married to a film producer. Um, he, they're both Icelandic, uh, he's a film director, and uh, he, he makes Hollywood films. He's, he's, he's a megastar. Has anyone in the room seen Contraband, Three Guns? <laughs> Anyway, I said we got a, we got this piece of land. It's the former former family uh, ranch or estate. And we bought it. It's really beautiful. You must come and see it. Want to build a house on it? So we go traipsing all over there. It's a four-hour drive. It looks like this. And uh, well, that wasn't too exciting. <laughs> but the thing is, like every site in Iceland, it's fantastic. So. Really, it's pretty pointless going. All we have to do is look at the map. And that's, that's the site. And if you look at the site, you can very quickly see a few things that might may be of interest, even though we couldn't see them in the bad weather. You're in Hof, that's the name of the place. You look back to the town of Hofsos. You look this way. There's an island, a volcanic plug out in the fjord called Durangde. You look at it that way. If you look this way, you can see Thorbehudli, which is another sort of headland, which is pretty dramatic. We can look up to Malmö here, which is another island, and that's where the, the, the Arctic sun goes down and kisses her eyes and bounces back up again in summertime. Or you can look at Ulladar and see the remains of glacier before it finally melts because of all you guys and all our guys are driving around and being called before. Just what I had to get that in before I just shoot in the bit of conscious there. <laughs> okay, you put those places on the map. And we want to put the house somewhere there, and then pop the house in the bingo to get a house. It looks something like this. And it's kind of obvious when you go to do those things. So in the bedroom wing here, you can look out and morning towards off sauce with the children's play area here from their bedroom. You look out towards off sauce. When you're having your evening dinner, you look out towards the drawing game. If you're playing or so this needs to be out of play. You look back towards Hop Source, out to Grande, or out to all those other nice places up there. Or if you're writing new film scripts here, you can look up and watch the glacier melt. So it's how it sort of fits there in the landscape. The other thing that's really important is that when you're out there in the middle of nowhere, you have to be <coughs> somewhere, otherwise you're lost. And you guys, I don't need to talk to you about space and about being in the desert and about having that obvious <coughs> amount horizon. And there's, there's actually very little close to you. Uh, you've got a few more sort of cacti and shrub that we have. You've just got uh, some grass. So we pull ourselves into really tight spaces. The bedroom wing is here in these enclosed, sunken spaces. And every morning you go up this, uh, this burnt passage and you get fallen again into the body of the house here. So there's this sort of riot of, of waking in the morning. And then there's a, a theatre of how you get your morning coffee. So I'll go to that in a minute. But the really crazy thing is that when you're dealing with someone like Lydia, who we disagree all the time. I mean, it's almost as bad as you know, living with Barbara. And, you know, I can't complain too much with Lydia because she plays the films. And she's insisting that the house should be here. I'm telling her that it has to be there. And we're standing in the middle of the field. It really doesn't matter who. Because you know, we're basically dealing with the horizon. You know, that's the way it works. So, the house was put where I put it, because I didn't want it. So, <laughs> anyway, we're talking about the house, and it's built in the house. You push it in, you make some sort of engagement with it. So it's actually not on the land, it's in the land. So here we've got this place. And then, when you put some deep land, you get some light in through the roof like this. You're never ever far from light, so at least when we have daylight. And then, here you can see the bedroom wing, that's sunken down, you drop to the ground, into the, the, the living spaces. And as you move through the plan, then the house separates. You have the bedroom wing, and then you have spaces between the buildings and then the, 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 uh, the living spaces themselves, the living room. And if you look at that, then you can see from those spaces between, you can see things like triangles. So the rooms are not in, only in the house, they're between the house. Everywhere that you are is actually the room. It's, it's, it's a part of a new space or a new landscape that we make. Then into the living room and here again we look out. And you'll see this before. Now of course all the magazines that published it, this 
want us to tell us who the supplier of this floor is, because they want to put an advert from that supplier so that they can make money out of us, because they've got a free picture. And the answer is, it came out of the ground. And this is where the whole ecological thing falls, because I don't know if you guys know this, this house is a bit viral on the internet, and it's been flagged as the passive house by the Arctic Circle, the ecological house by the Arctic Circle, all those names. None of those names came from us. For us, it's a flash house for a rich couple on the, at the very nice site in the north of Iceland, okay? But because it uses rock that comes from the foundation, that's eco-friendly. Even though we had to ship the rock 300 kilometers south to get it cut, and then 300 kilometers back again. That doesn't sound very ecological to me. The geothermal energy that we get has to be piped up from the borehole that belches out sulfur. And if we use uh, hydro energy, of course, that means damming high areas of uh, 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 So that's not ecological either. So all that ecological stuff is a bit of a conundrum. But still, we get a nice house, we get a really beautiful floor. So it means we have a happy client. And she can make her espresso in the morning and look out for his <coughs> But because it's a deep plan, she turns around and she will see the sea illuminated by the same sun, but it's going to be dim here if we didn't have this roof light up here. So we put light, that light comes out and lights here. The whole house is full of light, even early in the morning when the sun is coming light. And in the morning when you come out of bed, this is this is the this is your birthday wish in the house. And here you see pin pops of light. This is actually a roof light. A roof light above this is two foot diameter, but we only allow a tiny <coughs> opening in the concrete, so they call this a laser plot of light. The other roof lights in the building are larger. But of course, they only work in summertime because in the winter it gets dark, so we have to put a light in. <laughs> and then this is where the ecological thing really cuts in. Because you put grass on the roof, wow, you tick all the boxes. And then you get to a point because you can ride horses around it. And everyone goes to about that. So it's up the other, the other these, up these are recycled telegraph poles. So that, that's very important too. A bit of recycling and double flush toilets and you've got it. I'm mm -hmm. you know. Oh, I hate this one. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to tell you another story. And this is the really, really nice thing about this house. is that it's in a place that is easy to get in the summertime. It's a four hour drive, very pleasant. But in wintertime, it gets icy on the road, so you actually don't like flying there. So you try and fly, but the airport gets shut down, you get you know, Locked in the snow and stuff. So it could have been tedious. And now this is on a winter condition. It's, it's minus 10, it's blowing maybe 75 miles an hour, and it's difficult to build. And you know, you're trying to build a really nice house with visual concrete in these conditions. And that wouldn't happen if you didn't have people like Eric. And people like Eric, he sleeps on our drawings. So when I eventually get there in the middle of winter, after waiting at the airport or going on the plane or doing whatever I do, I go to site and I see that everything that is there on the site is exactly as it is on the drawings. I think, well, that's fine. I can turn around and have a go home again. I don't need to do it because he's done his job. He's respected me as I have respected him. And he also has got much better ideas about how to do things than I have because he's got experience of working in certain kinds of timber and certain kinds of weather conditions, much more experience than I have. So when listening to him, I can make the house much better than I ever imagined on paper. And he's got a bunch of guys that work with him, and they also have ideas, and they share those ideas with us. We work together, together as a collective team to make a piece of architecture. And if you don't listen to people like Eric, and if you don't work with people like Eric, and all the other consultants that you work with him, you can forget this profession that we call architecture. We can pack up, we can walk off in the bank, or we can open, open a hotel, which is the new gold mine in Iceland. Because it's all about teamwork, it's all about what it's done to make buildings that people really want to do. So thanks very good, we have this house. It's become something in the last few years, that's the original studio brand. After that, 
and told me is the reason that I'm here. Mm -hmm. Thank Erica, thank the client, and thank you very much for the consideration of time for visiting his wife. Thank you.